I wondered if we do like a Mark Maron vibe where we just chatting away, you know. And then yes. I go, oh, have we started? Sure, yeah. <laughs> I've done that a couple of times. And it's nice, actually, because sometimes people are really... Uh, oh, shit, really? <laughs> <laughs> what did I already say? <laughs> yeah. I'm always amazed by the uh, amount of work you put in to be prepared for the music. In any situation we've been in, you were always super on point with everything. You had everything, you learned everything. And uh, I, I'm wondering how you go about this, this process, what, what it is like for you. Um, I mean, if, if, you know, uh, making music with someone like you, it's, uh, it's vital because I th you're much quicker than I am. And, uh, and <laughs> I, I just I have to be ready on some level and, mm. and still, you know, I get there and I still make mistakes and stuff. But also the way that you write tunes, it's not overly trumpet friendly. Yes. You know, it's, it's not the kind of thing that you sh that you show up and go, oh yeah, this is comfortable. Mm -hmm. Particularly things like um, unlocking mechanism. Yeah. Where you're kind of within the space of a bar and a half, you're you yeah. know you've just spanned two and a half octaves or something. Yes. It's the kind of thing that I love to do actually on the on the horn, but yeah, uh, you seem very comfortable with it. Well, <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that. But you know, I wanted to ask you about, about um, this thing of having people um included in into like brought into the circle of your trio mm. because it's such a strong thing isn't it and you guys have been playing together since i don't know i mean you, you must you were super young right when you yeah. first formed that trio yeah it was like 19 i think yeah wow so this is our 15th year but ha having invited we always invited people from the start we did it in the beginning, we actually did it also because I was super unknown. And nobody knew me, so it was also a means of, okay, let's invite somebody so they maybe know this isn't, you know, bullshit or whatever, you know. Right, right, uh, right. So there was some of that also in the beginning. And also we, we were, like, trying out things with friends. And I always noticed how uh, whenever there's one other component coming into the equation that i mean it's it changes up everything yeah yeah so I mean, how do you, do you it, it, is this something that you've discussed as a trio yes like you have to adjust things okay often right um right. i mean there were discussions about inviting somebody and then not being able to play i mean we we, we talked about this are we not able to play like we play as a trio or and then there was the discussion of, do we have to play like we play when we're on just the three of us? No, of course not, because right. that, that wouldn't be um, truthful to the situation we're in. Sure. And then we decided that we want to have, <clears throat> of course, we have our thing that we do together. And this is nice to, to fall back on. But uh, we, have, uh, we have an opportunity there when somebody comes in you know, uh, to, to play differently and to accommodate to what this person needs or uh, yeah. might be inspired by, you yeah. know. So yeah. Yeah. we actually like to lean into these different directions then. Yeah. You know, we didn't play with you like we play with, uh, I don't know. Um, Nelson or Chris yeah, Potter right. or, yeah. Or, yeah. or Bo or, yeah. It's, it's different. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's interesting. I've thought a lot about this recently, the, the way that um, uh, perspectives interconnect with each other and the way that that sound and the, uh, the kind of the additives of sound become increasingly um, complex instantly. Right. There's, I, I saw this great lecture in um, Denmark once and it, this guy was talking about this Hegelian theory. And it, after doing a bit of research, uh, it, it's something called something like a the hegelian dialectic uh -huh. uh, in which um someone so for example in this in this situation where we're just chatting yeah. um you offer a thesis and then i offer an antithesis or antithesis yeah and then because of this connection there's a synthesis right so in theory it's 
uh, one plus one equals at least three. You yes, know? yeah, I like that. And it's lovely. And then in a musical setting, it's like, okay, well, how does how does this work? This the way that sounds interact. If we were to play a duo, would be yeah. one thing. But then another additive, for example, Robert. And then suddenly the 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 complexity is is increased exponentially. Yes. Yeah. And well, then of course, uh, yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking, even without playing. Right. I mean, the the complexity would also be there if we would just listen together. Right. For something right. to play, right? I mean. Right. Even before that tiny moment before you play, the complexity is 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 bigger if there's three, or four, right. or twenty. Right. 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 So uh, particularly, um, I mean, I remember when we when we first met um, uh, it was uh, it was with the, the Chris Potter thing. Yes. Chris Potter project. And I remember that because I was playing with the, the big band, WDR big band, and you were doing the other sets. So we kind of I can't remember how many gigs we did, maybe two or three. Uh, two or three. Yes. Something like that. Yeah. At least two, yeah. And it happened that there was, uh, while we were rehearsing in Cologne, there was a big food festival or something. Mm -hmm. So all the hotels were full. So Chris uh, and I were put in a hotel outside of town, this kind of amazing schloss yeah. place. It was totally amazing. So we were traveling, for the first couple of days, we were traveling in together. And he was saying, he was talking about you guys. And oh, yeah? um, I didn't really know about the trio yet. And... Uh, I think I'd heard your name, maybe, but I didn't know the other guys yet. And uh, he's, he was saying, yeah, I've just done a rehearsal with his trio, and they're really, they're really amazing. You know, they're really <laughs> kicking my ass. And I was thinking, what? What are you talking what? about? And then I heard you on this gig, and I just, I couldn't believe my ears. It was incredible. You were really pushing. And even someone like Chris Potter, who who feels so fluent and easy in any situation, it was like, okay. <laughs> right, you really found something new. It was, it was amazing. Wow. Yeah. I mean, we had the same feeling with you. Uh, you had yeah, uh, yeah. one or two uh, solos in the in the big band set, and we were like uh, always checking out what we. I think we played quartet first with Chris, mm -hmm. and then yeah. the big band played his uh, his music, and I think you had one or two features, and we were always look, looking forward to your solo, and I think we. The first time we properly then hung out or talked, I think, was when the trio came to Birmingham, which was right after that, right? That's that's right, yeah. And then we yeah. kind of clicked more and... And, uh, and I kept you in mind always. And then w once I got the opportunity to do um, the, the uh, artist in residence in Fiersen at the festival and the trumpet player I, I was supposed to play with, with my bigger ensemble, Glow, couldn't make it. I thought, oh, this is the perfect object. Now I can get him. And and I was so happy with how you approached this music. And, and I was wondering what the process was for you maybe to get into this music and then, then just step in like you did because it was full of um, enthusiasm and, and also you seemed very sure in a, in a very open sense, not in the negative, you know, sure of yourself, what you can do and what you, how you approach this music coming in as somebody from the outside, really, you know, we hadn't played together. There was like a super short rehearsal. And uh, yeah, I was, I was wondering how, how this was for you. And I think we never really talked about it. Yeah. It, I mean, I was super nervous because of, you know, uh, playing with you and this really, And it was it was interesting for me actually because I remember one of the biggest memories apart from our set, you played what, there was four sets right so you played a duo, Nelson, and then yeah. the trio played, yeah. and then you played a quartet with um, uh, Sebastian, mm -hmm. and then was it uh, was it the large ensemble last or something yes. maybe it's different, yeah. and I was thinking Jesus how does this guy have the energy <laughs> and commitment to play all these sets back to back basically, mm. and then, you know, could still walk, still walk away on skates. So that, that was amazing. So I knew about your, your capacity mm. for music. So I was slightly uh, nervous about the whole thing. And then getting to, I mean, Hubert was also there. Hubert yes. was also so yes. all these legends around and Philip <laughs> Hopper, you know, and mm. Neil's front line. It was just, yeah. But it, it's funny that preparation 
how you prepare for the unknown is a weird thing, isn't it? Yeah. So I think sometimes what I tend to do is listen to as many things of yours and the other people in the group as I can and get an idea of who's doing what, you know, so I get a picture in the mind first. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, check out the music. And then how, how, how do you do it? How do I listen to, how do I check out the music? Yeah. Well, I make sure I can play the notes and I I try and research uh, the recordings, whatever's Mm. out there to find and listen to. But that can be a weird thing in itself, can't it? I don't know whether you've had the same experience, but sometimes if you get too much of a strong picture of the voice, uh, it's, it was, um, was it mental on that recording? No, Menzel was on the first recording of yep. Glow, and the second one was Klaus Stötter. Ah, okay, yeah. And sometimes if you get, I mean, I, of course I know Klaus really well, yeah. but if, if you get too much of a picture of the voice of who you're replacing, yes. it can be really damaging in yes. a sense, I think. Because you end up feeling like that's the space that needs to be filled, yeah. because that's what, that's what the, the, the other members of the ensemble are used to, and that's what you want Mm-hmm. which which isn't the case no. i think no and it was great and f- so approaching the rehearsal and getting warmed up a little bit and then we stood on the stage and you said something like uh it, i mean it was really striking i can't remember exactly the way you phrased it but it was like you, you guys can basically do anything you know it's it's kind of it's now your music anything's possible just do what you feel yeah is appropriate and then suddenly i felt more ease it yeah. was like, okay, it's, it really is about uh, individuals and individual voices. And that, that was a big lesson for me about you and your perspective on ah, music cool. making, well, which is it, totally in alignment with my own. Yeah. Thank you for checking out the podcast. If you enjoy these conversations, please join me on patreon.com slash Pablo Held for more educational videos on various musical topics, early access to episodes, lead sheets, online hangouts, listening sessions, music recommendations, band camp discount, and more behind-the-scenes stuff from the podcast. The generous support of my patrons helps me to pay for the running costs of the podcast, and it also helps me to keep it going into the future. Thank you so much, and let's get back to the episode. It's weird to say it, but some, most of the times when somebody can't make it, in a project, I feel like, <laughs> cool, <laughs> this is an opportunity, right. you know, right. obviously with the trio, um, it's hard to do because th- those guys aren't really into, ch- you know, t- how do you say that you can't really change up the, the, re- the, the personnel, um, yeah. but still we had to do it sometimes. And I always feel like it's an opportunity to try something. And also if, um, if there's a quartet and it's, it's really tight group, and there's one, as we talked about it, the complexity changes even within if we, if we exchange somebody. And then, um, but that does something to my relationship. Let's say Jonas can't make it. And mm-hmm. we are a quartet uh, with you and Robert and Jonas. And Jonas can't make it and we're, we're asking another drummer. That does something to the relationship of you, Robert and me. Because we have to yeah. be t- even tighter to be strong right. enough for the new guy to come in. And... Um, and obviously the 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 smaller connections even also like Robert and me and you and me you know and it does something to the music and there also if you allow that new person to bring in their spin I mean you have to choose wisely obviously who you choose to replace but um, that can be opportunity for the music and there was I think there was one gig that I did with. Um, uh, I was supposed to do it in trio. We were invited to play in. Sorry. I was invited to a, a play a festival at Chisi now, um, and um, Robert and Jonas, uh, Jonas couldn't make it. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna. I want to play. I need to play. <laughs> I need to bring in some money also. And I thought of it as an opportunity and asked Christian Lillinger and Sebastian Gille. And we played some tunes that we played in the trio. And Christian Lillinger. Uh, brought to Stubborn, you know, Stubborn we played together as well. Yeah. He brought yeah. to that song an approach that I hadn't anticipated and uh, that then became something that I sometimes encourage people to do now when we play the song, you know. So um, 
I think each of these moments can have an opportunity. And mm. with you, mm. that was a big lesson for me, you know, having you in there, you totally uh, brought the music into a different direction. And, and um, I, I, I loved what, we, what you did with it. And, uh, you know, I hope we can do more with the big ensemble, but that, of course, feels very far away right now. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you, do you feel like, um, uh, how do I phrase this? Um, if it weren't for these kind of interventions from other musicians, um, do you feel like you have a, a, a kind of um, a set path, an approach to improvising or, or making music um, that isn't necessarily within your ideal uh, approach? So, for example, um, talking about these 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 interactions these interventions from other musicians um f for me they're absolutely vital otherwise i get into a th i get into my own thing too much and i just get lost in my own world a little bit too much and then end up um, musically not really saying the things that i would ideally say if that mm. makes sense does that make any sense yeah yeah i think yeah, that, I mean, think that, I think that's um, that happens so often. If we don't listen to what the others are doing, uh, or take their input as an opportunity to play something different, we get stuck in our own ways and and do the things that are, in a way, automatics. Although they are part of our sound, but they're not mm. truthful to the moment and uh, the situation we're in. Otherwise, mm. it would be something new. Because, you know. Uh, but there's a fine line here, isn't there? I think sometimes with particularly someone like you who's playing people know so well. Um, do you ha ever have the experience where people maybe play in a certain way because they think that's what you, you yes. want them to do? Yes. Right. I've experienced this and I really don't like it. <laughs> yeah. You know, so yeah. sometimes if I do a session with uh, somebody who might know my trio or so I, I feel like sometimes drummers try to do something like Jonas is doing or right. bassists and they often they mistake what I really like about Robert and Jonas you know right um right. it's the usual thing of copying somebody you really just copy the 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 sur uh, is this the, the top sur layer yeah the top exactly. layer yeah and that the is surface, the yeah. thing that is usually Maybe even what the person themselves don't really like <laughs> so much, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sure. So people get misunderstood by by the um, half-assed copying uh, mechanisms, you know. Right. I find this a lot with you know people also like Mark Turner and and or Kurt Rosenwinkel and uh, people who have such a strong and I identifiable voice. Mm -hmm. People usually only copy the the top layer, and thereby it loses it loses the it loses the magical stuff that is underneath, and then everybody starts sounding like Mark Turner, and that can sometimes harm the way I listen to at, uh, to Mark Turner, which who's playing I right. love, you know, it's it's, it's right. amazing. Yeah. But if everybody yeah. is going in that direction, it's hard for me to go back to the real thing because. You know, the ear is saturated by the the kind of <laughs> Montana yeah. light. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So how do you? I mean, how does one avoid that? I mean, is do you think that? I mean, I've 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 kind of got a little bit of a beef with uh, transcription at the moment, yeah. and how people go about transcription. Is that is that the factor that's damaging? I feel think? I feel like um, everybody has to find their individual approach and that's basically i think the key um to 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 your own path maybe but um i feel like what i think is most valuable is the transcription part writing down what somebody plays is just the beginning i feel right and then it's right. really not about the amount of solos or the amount of bars right. but it's really about the amount of time you put into to really go deep on the thing that you really love about the solo. If you, even if there's your favorite Freddie Hubbard solo, there's certain moments that you gravitate more towards to than others. 
And those are the moments that give you a sign, I, f I feel, you know, about yourself. You yeah. learn something about yourself if there's the moment of, oh, wow, what is, I need to know what, what is this, you know? Yeah. And yeah, I, yeah. I have, I have um, that's actually physical reactions to something like this, you know? Right. Goosebumps right. or whatever, you know? These are right. indicators of, you, had, you have to know what this is. Don't transcribe yeah. the whole solo. I mean, you right. could. But spend the time on these moments because they tell you something about yourself. Absolutely. What are what are moments like this? Can you because I, I'm sure you have memories of 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 moments like this where you had had to know what what it is that's going on. Like, yes, with players yeah. that you love. Yeah. yeah. Can you share a couple? Yeah, I mean, uh, I remember hearing Kenny Wheeler for the, for the first time and. And, and not really understand, understanding what's happening, you know. I, I didn't understand from a harmonic perspective all that special time that he had, but I didn't understand how a human being could make that sound on the trumpet. Yeah. And, and it's funny with, um, uh, at least for me with Kenny, there's, there's really no point in transcribing mm -hmm. those things. Because for me, it wouldn't give me anything. I wouldn't learn anything new from it. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's it, the intangible thing. You can't... Um, I love that, I, that that thing about music that it's it's just vibrations in the air, and actually yeah. once we capture them and put them on a page, mm. you've diluted it somewhat, you know. So actually, actually trying to capture the the magic in this way do, doesn't work. For okay, me. but how about trying to play it like him, and then yeah. working on stuff that you found there? Yeah, it's funny. Uh, uh, Kenny apparently once was talking about trying to study bebop. And he just, he basically said, oh, I tried to play bebop, but it came out wrong. And I think that's, <laughs> that's a lovely thing because yes. when I do the same thing and try and sound like Kenny, it comes out wrong. Mm -hmm. But through, through, that, through that wrongness, if you like, if yes. that's even a, a word, um, it comes freshness, you know. Yes. And I think that for me that the transcription process um, is inadequate in this sense. When people try and focus on the person or the thing that they're transcribing too much, that becomes the center of what they're aiming for. It, right. it doesn't give you as much. Instead, I, I, at least I try and encourage people to imagine that they are the focus. Yeah. And then the transcription becomes the lens through which they're looking at themselves. Yes. And then you get, you kind of, you get more out of it because you're still focusing on the development of the individuality of, yeah. you know, of, of, of voice which is what we need. We don't need another Chris Potter. We don't need another Mark Turner. No. But we need we need new people with new perspectives. And I think that's yeah. a, that's that was always important for me as well. Mm. Apart from just not being able to sound like Freddie or Clifford, <laughs> even though I tried really hard for a while. Yeah. yeah. How did you do it? How did you try? I mean, the usual old process is learning the sound of the recording, singing along, playing along, writing it down. Mm. But still, you know you can't be that person mm -hmm. so actually what you i don't know i used to think it was a it was a, a the idea of the melting pot you know you put a little bit of chet baker you know you put yeah. a little bit of kenny wheeler a little bit of woody shaw and then that becomes your voice but i think it's more complex than that i think it's yeah. it's also it's an empirical thing it's about experience it's about learning through the process of doing you know it yes. isn't just about having a book of transcriptions no. Oh, I've done this, this work. I've created this work product. Yeah. You know, as if you're going to carry it to a gig under your arm. And, yes. Oh, sorry. I'm just going to get my... Wait, guys. I'm just I gonna... think this, this sounds like page 70. Let me see. Yeah, right. I think page 70 is appropriate <laughs> for this situation. Yeah. Go. Yeah. 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 Some people play like that. Some people play like that. Yeah. yeah. And it's kind of remarkable. It's, it's the recitalist, you know. I think it's, mm -hmm. there's something wonderful in that. And there's something so attractive to the ear because we know the sound of yeah. this and it's and, and the, the ear loves familiarity so yeah. when someone rocks up and sounds a bit like kenny dorham you go wow that's amazing maybe i should do that. oh no, mm, no I should. yeah <laughs> yeah it's a funny thing huh. what are you working on right now what's working in your head is there something that you're trying to figure out yeah i'm trying to yeah always something I'm just always feeding the beast that is the trumpet and trying to make sure that I can <laughs> that I can play it. Trying to get good 
which is um, for me a nightmare in itself. Mm. So that that takes up quite a lot of time. And then also just ideas of linear construction, you know, thinking in intervals and thinking in um, um, I've got I've got a really good friend in he, he's actually an American chap called John O'Gallagher, uh, incredible alto player, like mind blowing alto yeah. player, and also the um, publisher of a, a book called uh, Twelve Tone Row Improvising. I think it's on Advance mm-hmm. Music, and um, I mean he's he's currently doing a um, a PhD in Lake Coltrane, like transcribing and that, analyzing yeah. you know interstellar regions and stuff, and he's talking about these um, like these tri-chord sets and it's just it's totally blowing my mind so i'm trying to understand that a little bit but i'm incredibly slow yeah do you want to show some some of that oh i don't know whether i <laughs> i mean i'm at the very beginning of this pablo <laughs> i shouldn't really but maybe i'll try anyway yeah uh I'm I'm probably the last person who should be talking about this because I don't fully understand it yet. But maybe uh <laughs> So that would be uh oh one uh oh one two what does I want three? Sorry. I was wondering about this. What does the because I read I read a little bit of, of what he uh, somewhere online I found something about it and and you also told me about it before I think. But what yeah. does O mean and what does one mean and so z- zero would be for example the starting point z- ground zero. Okay. As far as I understand. Right. So in this case I'm using a concert A flat. <laughs> So two, uh, uh, one would be, so O1 would be a semitone above. Uh, so that would be O, one, three. Why three? Because there's one semitone missing? So I'm still working from, yeah, still working from zero. Yeah. Yeah. So one uh, zero one two would be. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So um, I mean, I'm really a total beginner at this. I think John. Would yeah, tell but me what off. you played <laughs> sounded incredible. It's uh, and I'm trying to understand. Well, so the next thing would be um, this is just one one of the. I mean, he talks about this particular tone row. So it's a twelve tone row based on these, on these um, uh, um, sets. Mm-hmm and then going to a b flat and then we're going to do um o becomes actually it becomes um uh o two three this time yeah. and then we do the same pattern from the tritone And then I've just been trying to think about um, ways of displacing octaves and, and organizing them in a slightly different right. way. For example. Yeah. But Which that sounds a, similar to, to things that I've heard you play before. So, I mean, yeah, I think, that's something that I've, I've, I'm also curious about how you went about figuring out to ex- escape the octave <laughs> in a way yeah. escape the octave yeah. that you're in yeah i think i think i tend to hear lines like this and it's, intuitively i'm attracted to these sounds but i don't really know what they are yet so it's kind of in a way retrospectively understanding ah the the approach if you see what i mean which is why i'm so slow with all this you know trying to just even describe what we're doing yeah but i've always been interested in in um 
uh, what's the word, kind of like rotating pitches mm-hmm. around axes points uh, to, to give different sounds, for example. Yeah. And, and using different intervals for, for uh, maybe I should just play an example. Yeah. Uh, thinking of like flat nines in certain directions. Mm. Oh, sorry, wrong note. Like going up flat nines, coming down major sevens. For yeah. Example. That sounded incredible. Oh. That sounded incredible. But it's it's a way to limit yourself. But the limitation becomes a a free a process of freeing up, right? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's just the same way that you would use traditional vocabulary. Yeah. Or, you know, something simple that mm. everybody knows. But actually, it's I think it's the, the embedding of the linguistic process and then the transformation of that that embedded language in the in a real world context. Yeah. So. If, For me, like we talked about a minute ago, the the guys who show up and they play lick number 17 on the, the, yeah. the bridge of Cherokee. And you go, wow, that's amazing. But actually, in a way, I kind of I don't want to hear it so much. I want to hear how their individualistic perspective yeah, transforms that. Yeah, what's your that. view on it? Yeah. I feel like those books of transcription are also, they're great for the person who does them, you right. know, because of the process. You know, they must be fun. Yeah. Uh, make a book out of 20 Joe Henderson solos. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. But I feel like yeah. I don't feel like reading them. Right. <laughs> right. It feels like I, yeah. I'm I'm somebody has done the work, the 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 thrilling work, and now I'm just reading it. Right. Uh, it's sight reading practice. It's sure. sight, yeah. You could see it at the, as that, but some people see it as you know that's where I get my language from. You know. Sure. And yeah. I, f- I feel this is misleading. And yeah. um, somebody has done yeah. the work for you. And that's yeah. just another step in the recent development of, of things that somehow make it easier for us musicians. You know, yeah. apps, yeah. transcription Shortcuts. apps, uh, um, uh, play along apps or whatever. But they actually make it harder. I think it's, it's uh, uh, it seems like a shortcut, but it's actually... A diversion or um, what, what is it what's the word you know yeah it prolongs yeah. The, wonder, the, the journey i think sure yeah but i just i wonder that um we're talking about this having already done some of that work ourselves and now we have that empirical knowledge that actually that isn't what we're looking for but is that journey a necessary want in the early stages The journey I mean. of transcription, or like one one should do this in order to to get over the hill that tells us that we don't need to do this. <laughs> well, I feel we need to do it. I feel we need to. I feel we. I feel we need to uh, um, spend time with what has come before. I yeah. feel we have to do that, and the the way you do it is. I think that's up to you. Uh, the only objective, I feel, is is make it thorough and make it personal, you know, yeah. but how yeah. you do it, that's your own thing. But yeah. I think there's no, there's no way you, you land on this, this earth and somebody hands you an instrument and you're not going to spend time with what came before and make great music. Right. I feel this is, this is just a little bit too much fairy tale for me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 And you you, rem, you reminded me of the you know the shags, the you shags, know? yeah. You What know, are that, the shags? That, it's the, that girl band who's. I think they were all sisters, if I remember correctly. They're all sisters, and the father made sure that they hadn't heard any music, but gave them instruments to you know about <laughs> this stuff. <laughs> and it sounds it sounds like nothing else you've ever heard, but whether it's good or not, I don't know. Sure, I'm sure it sounds different. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Most of the yep. people I admire, or I think all of them, spend time studying what came before them, you know? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Whether it inspired them to be in, in alignment with that tradition or, you know, contrary or, yeah. to it, it's, it's the same thing. I feel like the more you study, the more 
I mean, I feel like, you know, I feel like more work is in, uh, put in into the deep study. I think the more they go away from it. I think it's just a natural thing, right? Yeah. I mean, the, yeah. Yeah. the more time you put into, okay, how does this work? What is this? And then you are like, fine, but let me see what I can do with it, you know, and then it becomes, yeah. then it becomes personal. Right. right. For you, did, um, did Hubert have a big, a big um, influence in this kind of approach? Yes, yes. I mean, uh, he, he showed me ways to, to, look at, to look at things from a lot of perspectives and to, to see how, how they, you know, sometimes I might come with an interesting chord progression that I found in a piece, and to me they just sounded like cool sounds, you know. Right. But he put them right. into context for me. You know, showing right. me, okay, this is basically pretty simple if you look yeah. at it like this. And I was like, right. how can he see what is behind this? I want to be able to see what's behind it. Because ultimately, that's what I have struggled with understanding what's behind it. But that's basically the, 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 the ground rules of this music. Um, that I haven't understood yet properly. Right. And I'm still right. working on getting this fundament so so in, instilled in myself so that I can trace in a, in a funny uh, corporation by Wayne which seems like a child made it up and but it's right. like it, it's fairy tale right. you know right. but right. Wh why does it sound so good you know and what's the and how can I play over it usually makes it you know that question is usually answered by understanding what's behind it. And then you see, oh, it's actually pretty simple. And therefore I can, you know, go this, this way. And so Hubert, um, just being around him and seeing how he looks at things and how he's trying to put things into contexts. And, and um, you know, he would always have sheet music um, on his, on his, on his piano and there would only always be something you know he would be working on show me a chord and you see this chord uh and he played it for me and it sounded like otherworldly then he's like yeah but it's just this if you invert you know or if you put those together it becomes this scale and let's see how on which chord we could use this scale and stuff like that you know yeah, yeah. so that has been very very influential for me and i've, I've done that that's all I'm doing, you know. Right, right, <laughs> I'm, right. Most of what I'm doing is trying to understand the music that I love, and then seeing purposes and 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 uh, and opportunities to use that. But the moment I use it, it becomes something different because I take it out of the context, and as you said, with the lens, I'm looking through it sure. at the stuff yeah. that I'm looking at, which is yeah. different from what Messian looked at, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Recontextualize, it becomes a whole other, a whole other thing with a completely different meaning. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I was in yeah. this uh, uh, masterclass by Greg Osby, and he said uh, a complex thing is usually uh, two simple things put together. Right. And it totally makes yeah. sense to me. I mean, you yeah. can see it in, in Sacre du Printemps, and if you look at voicings uh, right. or, uh, and right. Or rhythms or whatever you know it's usually yeah. two simple things together but Absolutely. how he puts it puts it together it becomes a new thing yeah yeah absolutely so understanding this concept made made a big impression on me because therefore i need to understand those ingredients to be able to juggle with them you know yeah what what was uh, one dimensional becomes three dimensional and mm. then you can control the elements around the yeah. newly formed surfaces of the the object. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, totally. I really loved the moment when um, I always loved uh, being on on car rides with you, talking real, you know, real talking about real stuff, uh, and and being very very honest about all the shortcomings that we see in our playing. And I always felt like I could share a lot of things with you. And we share some um, some struggles together also. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm sure you remember we, we talked about leaving spaces, the this, this, this struggle of leaving space and also letting us know what maybe few, uh, um, further developments in our battle against, you know, yeah. Yeah. the need to play so much. Um, How's that going? It's getting better. I think it's getting better. And I've also I've, I've um, gotten a reassurement from, I think I talked to Robert about it. And he said, yeah, I can hear different, I can hear your leaf spaces. And in the beginning, I really had to force myself. And he yeah. said, in the beginning, it totally sounded forced. Like, right. now I'm going to leave a space. But it was nice for him because there was a space to fill up <laughs> then for him to play. Right. Um, right. But also, he said, now it's uh, sounding more um, organic. Organic and, and, and coming yeah uh, it's just natural more natural and i'm still yeah. you know I, I can totally see the moments where i'm like okay oh, you know stop stop please <laughs> stop playing you know yeah and yeah. it's basically coming out of fear and you know but it was so helpful to have somebody like you there who's struggling with the same thing and then sometimes even talking after gigs to each other and like yeah how did that go for you you know yeah yeah I was wondering yeah. how, where are you in the process right now? I wish I could report such success. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, certainly the last the last year, ninety nine percent of my playing has been here in the in the big. I'm just sitting in the studio yeah. here at the NDR, uh, which is a, a for me incredibly challenging environment to improvise in. Mm. Because you get, I mean, so often the <laughs> the music um, can be quite frantic and uh, there's so much going on. So you're kind of fighting against many more voices than than you would be in a small band, particularly a, a trio, you know. The other thing is that not really completely knowing the musicians that you're improvising with, like rhythm sections change often here. So actually it's, it's kind of, you're trying to learn how to work with someone and then it's all over. So, and then the other complex thing is, um, the big band selling in a big band is really kind of nuts. You know, it's hard. Yeah. 16 bars. Go. Yeah. Stop. It's like, okay, cool. You know, and, it, and it's, it's another layer of, um, anxiety for you, you know, as an improviser leaving space when you don't have much space. And also I tend to force, force things through too much yeah so um yeah not so good actually Pat, <laughs> thanks for asking <laughs> but uh, uh, you just said leaving space when you don't have much space you have space but you don't have time right isn't it i mean i guess this, the space is there yeah yeah but there's not much the time to, because you feel like okay i have this amount of time to after playing, you know, I don't know, do you play third trumpet, tw- second trumpet or? Fourth trumpet, the fourth. lowest of all trumpets. Okay. Um, you've played fourth trumpet for, you know, 90 minutes of the show and now you have, you know, your moment to yeah. shine and finally, yeah. you know. Yeah. That's hard. It's a, it's, it is hard. And the idea of space, I mean, space is... Um, Space doesn't just come from you, does it? I mean, space is space in the music, which is about the music breathing, which is about having confidence in the other musicians that you're with, with, having trust in the other musicians that you're with to have the same, like to to have a shared um, idealistic outcome, right? You, You have to trust that the people you're working with share the same ideals musically yeah. and artistically, you know? Yeah. So actually, I don't know. And this is certainly not me shifting blame by any means, mm. but sometimes if you feel like you don't, if the space isn't just coming from you, because it's, it's a responsibility mm. from every, every corner of, of the ensemble, I think. Mm. What am, I, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to be very nice about this. Maybe you can tell. <laughs> um, 
sometimes, particularly in the big bands, um, people are playing music, but first and foremost, they're playing a role in the music. They're playing their part in the, they're, yeah, they're playing their part in the big band. And sometimes to, to go from that and expect people to be able to instantly um, switch into a perspective of openness and inclusivity away from that specified, you know, musical notated part. Does this make sense? Yes, totally. It's, it's a difficult thing. To, it's a very difficult thing to do. Mm. Yeah. Especially and, if we rehearse it for one or two weeks, you know, there might have been great moments in the rehearsals, you know, or or, or the other way yeah. around, you know, it feels bad in the rehearsals. And finally, when you're on stage and th the concert situ situation is there, you finally realize, ah, that's, that was the last time I, I played with a big band, was with the WDR big band, and we played a I concert with... Clang, yep. and you know yep. we played Ascent from my latest record. Yeah, Sounds and in the rehearsals, oh, thank you. In the rehearsals, I had really trouble. I was just playing, 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 playing because also it was uh, a struggle and and uh, a challenge also to to integrate the 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 written horn parts into the what I. Yeah, where I was soloing very freely with the trio. But in the concert, I somehow realized, okay, this is now there is a space. Now I can leave the space and then just see what happens. And, you know, sometimes it takes the concert situation to remind you what's, what's important, right. I think. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And it's interesting in those moments that you... In a way, um, thinking with the, like reversing the mind, so you're, you're not actually the soloist anymore, mm -hmm. and actually your your perspective becomes to accompany the written material, mm -hmm. and then more freeness occurs naturally sometimes. I think, mm -hmm. but that's that's also a difficult thing to to get into. Yeah. yeah. Also, it's funny at the moment because everything. I mean, everything that we do just now, which isn't so much these days, um, is it has a feeling of permanence. You know, mm -hmm. it's either recorded for I don't know for a, a, a right. record or a specific project, or if you play if you do play a concert, it's live streamed but also yeah. recorded, and then it's left on Facebook or yes or YouTube or something. So whether you feel it or not that has some impact on uh -huh. how you approach making the music in the moment yeah this this idea of okay well this is it's a one take thing so you better sound good you know it's going yeah. to be here forever and but, we lose that frivolousness that that you would get from just playing a small show uh, you know in a club or something it just made me think about that i'm really recording a lot of things that i'm playing Usually, mm -hmm. as you saw, you know, we played gigs together and I'm usually recording them because I think it helps me, this feeling sometimes, you know, yeah. this is going to be recorded. I better sound good. I better play like I want to sound uh, listening back to it, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's interesting. And, and also in this process of leaving spaces, you know, those recordings really help me a great deal to understand sure. i think we talked about this the feeling yeah. of time yeah. the feeling of time um how how fast time feels when you listen to it and how slow time feels when you play it you know in the amount of time uh, uh, a certain pause that you left and you felt really yeah. proud and good about in the moment sure. is yeah. super short in in real time yeah in a durée i think say again i didn't really it Inner dure, the way that we perceive time from within. Oh, I think, yeah, yeah. It's a new word. But for you me. know, it, it, it's interesting. Um, you say this because I, I, ne I never got to that point of feeling good when the when the red light is on. You know, when mm. the recording is happening. And uh, I've been very lucky to work with um, Evan Parker quite yeah. a lot, and I remember him saying. Hey, you know, um, the best music happens in rehearsals and sound checks. And, he, and from my experience, he's, 
it's totally right. Mm -hmm. But why is that? Well, it's because, in my opinion, yeah. it's because there's a, a wonderful freeness that comes from not caring, you know. Yeah. When there's no um, uh, consequence to your actions. Yes, <laughs> you, yes. You know, and you can play anything you want. And, you, and there's, a, there's a kind of, there's a playfulness, there's a naughtiness in the, in the, in the in the air you know mm. think some great stuff happens and certainly from my experience the most fun i've ever had playing music has been in people's front rooms or you know yeah. rehearsal studios and stuff i can't think very often that it's been on stage mm. and maybe because that because my perspective has been clouded by you know n nervous feelings or you know mm. a feeling of pressure or something mm. but isn't that also curious because People who admire what you do, they don't think you're nervous. Exactly. I don't think you're nervous. You know, yeah. I don't. Yeah. But it's the inner perspective that is so different from what people people see, you know. Yeah. Also, you don't care if I'm nervous. And I also <laughs> don't care if you're nervous. Right. We just want to play music together. Yeah. So just cutting out the ego is a, you know, that's a complex thing in its, in itself, mm. I think. Yeah. Leave the ego at the door. I don't know. Is that mm -hmm. possible? Maybe. I, I mean, know. we to can aspire extent. to it. We can as sure. aspire to it. Yeah. And people yeah. get, some people get closer to it and others don't. And, uh, yeah. it's a, it's a process. What did Evan Parker say about it? I, I mean, apart from that. Or what was his conclusion of when the nicest music happens there? What? I mean, this actually this was a it was a fleeting comment during a sound check, and it was it was one of those moments where you're really getting into something. I don't know whether you have the same thing, um, particularly when playing improvised music, like free music. Yeah. You you get up, you set up, and you start playing, and it feels fantastic, and you have to go. Okay, that that's it. We're gonna. Somehow you kind of wear it out before the gig. Yeah. And I think it was one of those moments, okay, that's enough, you know, the best music happens, but you have yeah. to, in a way, try and save it for the, save it for the stage. Yeah. yeah. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Although I sometimes have the, um, the experience in maybe more in a, a um, session vibe where you play standards get together with friends, play standards. Usually the first song feels best for me. Right. And then the process comes of, ah, what should we play next? Do you know this tune? No, I don't, I don't know this tune. Do you know maybe this? No. And then already the vibe is kind of, you know. Right. Although it's friendly and we're all hanging out and, oh, you don't know, it's no problem. You know, let's, let's find another one. Okay, let's play this one. Yeah, and usually the first one has a, you know, you you agree on something, or even somebody starts playing something, you know. Right, right. And then everybody, I feel like I would uh, I would like to get into that type of standard um, session vibe a little bit more. Just somebody starts a tune. If you know it, you you know you play with them or you um, try to learn it in that moment, like listening to right. it. I would right. like a vibe like that because sometimes this this bouncing back and forth with song suggesting and then landing on the stuff, you know, the basic stuff that everybody knows, which are great tunes, but they get sometimes a little bit destroyed by being, yeah, let's play Body and Soul. Although Body and Soul is such a great song, you know, and you can, there's so much stuff if, if if it would just happen, somebody would play the first phrase. And I, I mean, I don't know. Maybe it's just uh, uh, finding a different entry point into the, the jam the, feeling. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you, you need the right people for this kind of thing, I think. Mm. The uh, people who are open and, and willing to, you know, the ego thing, they, they need to be able to relax the ego a little bit. Or you you start making sessions where you agree what you're going to play. That's also fun. Mm -hmm. Like in advance. These? Yeah. 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 We used to do, um, I mean, a few years ago in Birmingham, we used to do a, 
um, a regular Monday night gig, me and a, a, a drummer and called Andrew Bain, a colleague from the university. Mm-hmm. Great drummer. And we would, um, it was just he and I would just invite other people every week and we'd just play tunes, you know, mm. for an hour and a half set and just, but we would always agree what tunes to play. And it was great fun. It was yeah. really nice playing these. Because often, you know, week to week, we'd inevitably we'd choose similar tunes because they, they were in the public repertoire. Mm-hmm. Yeah, interesting. But, um, you know, uh, actually, just coming to back to this point from earlier, it was, it was funny how you'd invite people along and, and we'd invite people that, who's playing we really like and, you know, we want to make music with. But somehow they would play in a certain way that they would think that... We, you know, we want we wanted them to play this way, or mm. it, was, it was really interesting experiment. Yeah. Did you play bass or trumpet in that second? Mostly day? trumpet. Yeah. yeah, mostly trumpet. I really feel like yeah. when I listen to you play bass, and then again listen to you play the trumpet, you have this the, this additional perspective, rhythm section perspective, that enables you to um, be more inside of the rhythm section when you play the trumpet. I really feel this, you know, on a, on a rhythmical, uh, but also harmonic standpoint, um, that you can be inside of the rhythm section as a horn player. And that's really something that I admire about you. And, and I think that other people should <laughs> also, you know, aspire to more. Um, some people are, are, um, are questioning why why it's hard sometimes to connect with the rhythm section or really, really uh, find find a common ground. And I think uh, a lot of it has to do with finding an understanding for what somebody else is doing. Right, right. So I'm curious about why uh, and how you studied the work of great rhythm sections and, and how you try to apply it then to your trumpet and bass playing. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I started bass when I was maybe 19 or something um, because I I really loved that record with Ray Brown and Oscar Peters and Ed Thick at Night Train. Yeah. And it was just the most incredible feeling. Mm. And uh, and it, it was one of those moments I needed to know what that is. Like, how do they do that? Yeah. And it wasn't, it wasn't about the bass. I mean, I love the sound of Ray Brown. It was just incredible swinging feeling you know yeah. um but it, it, it i needed to f- understand what they were doing somehow mm. you know so I, I, I took a bass home and actually at the time that at the university um during my um bachelor's there weren't many bass players so i kind of borrowed a bass uh, for the summer and then just kind of worked out some stuff and then came back and joined a s- small band and just just played from there mm. But it was um, it was really um, a, a kind of mind altering experience, working within the rhythm section, as opposed to being on the periphery all the time, which horn players mostly are. You know, yeah. it's a it's a it's a funny thing. I think everyone should play some rhythm section somehow mm. to, to to see what it's like from the inside and it's a special thing and it's a, i mean that that's kind of what i was getting at earlier talking about you and the and the trio it's this it's this really deep connected unit that actually you know you kind of open a little bit to to allow people like me to say hello <laughs> but still <laughs> it's it's some kind of symbiotic thing that i'll never fully understand Hmm. or or anyone else or right. us <laughs> right. right right yeah 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 but it's very special and it, it really helped me in terms of learning tunes of course mm-hmm. and understanding the function of harmony and how the the way that harmony is so deeply connected it's not just um Separate instead of thinking parts. yeah exactly which is what i was doing on the horn before this yeah yeah trying yeah. to learn chords a series of chords not really seeing how things fit together and the relationship but then also rhythmically and, and f- finding that feeling of buoyancy and i love it that you, the, the your quartet is called the buoyancy yeah band it's lovely and that, that always was an important thing for me this buoyancy that happens when you get this alignment of feeling particularly between the the ride symbol and the bass 
the mm-hmm. bass note. So I really got into this for a long time and, and um, working really specifically with time and, and placement of time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I think um, I've ended up as a bit of a, uh, a bully on bass. So I don't think people <laughs> tend to like it so much. <laughs> I mean, you're yeah. very you're very active, and you're very engaging, and yeah. and very present. That's a polite way of thank you, Pablo. No, no, I'm just pointing out, you know, that what what is coming at me when I listen to you, you know, that's and and engaging and and also, it's not a look at me thing. Point. It's more, it's more, um, come on, let's play. Let's have fun. It's, this yeah. is fun, yeah. you know? And yeah. sometimes yeah. We, we lose this, uh, these virtues, having fun, you know? Yeah. Because yeah, we take yeah, it yeah. so seriously and, and, you know, the having fun vibe is, um, do you, do you think you have more fun on the trumpet than on the bass? I think, um, I, I'm lucky to not care about the bass at all. It's just for me. It's a means to to connect with people, mm. and I've never been a big practicer. I think I did a couple of months of practice when I first started. Mm. And the good thing about the bass is, I'm I'm sure bass players will hate me for <laughs> revealing this <laughs> secret. I'll be out of the magic circle, you know. But the bass is great because it's, if you're disciplined about how you approach playing it, every time you play it, you've improved. Well, certainly that's my mm-hmm. experience. Isn't it the so same I with play, trumpet? No. No. no, no. If you're way. disciplined no. about the way you play it, every time you will. No. If I play a gig on bass and I'm and I'm conscious about what my body's doing after the gig, the next day I'm better. If I play a gig on trumpet, the next day I've got to do practice to repair what I did the day before. <laughs> Why? I mean, being conscious about your body doesn't that help you? I think I don't know, Pablo. I think I'm an. I, unfortunately, I think I'm a natural bass player. And, and not a natural trumpet player. Mm. But I just, I don't have the same attraction somehow to bass. I love playing bass, but I can't imagine practicing it on my own. Yeah. Jesus. Like, it's, a, it's a social <laughs> instrument. It's a community instrument, you yeah. know. I need people to, to play with. Mm-hmm. But yeah, trumpet's a whole other thing. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the other thing is that, you know, The function of the bass from the, you know, coming from the perspective that I'm interested in, it's a supportive, you know, it's a supportive role, even if I am somewhat overly active and <laughs> excitable. It's a supportive role. It's it's about putting energy towards a collective yeah. thing. But it has a particular role, you know. I don't, and there's something beautiful about the piano, that you have all these voices there. I've always been envious of this thing. It's like a self-supportive ecosystem mm-hmm. yeah. somehow. I don't know. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a yeah. solo instrument also. I mean, right. you can play on yeah. your own and yeah. uh, very easily accommodate all the different registers. And I mean, it's hard to play, but um, it's not, you can't compare it to trumpet being a solo instrument like that, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've been trying to work on some uh, solo things recently. Mm. How? And it actually just, um, I mean, I, I, I've been really lucky to hang out a lot with this guy, Peter Evans. You know, Peter? Yeah. I mean, he's just, a, he's a total genius. And he, mm. whenever we play together, it, it makes me feel like I was literally given a trumpet that morning or something, <laughs> you know, like I'm a total beginner. And he's such a, an inspiration for the solo thing. Yeah. So, I mean, his his voice is always strong, somehow. But just finding ways that I can, but particularly uh, what I'm working on at the moment is finding ways that I can inject, like the the um, three dimensional thing. Yeah. So so I can have certain sounds, like extended technique sounds on this surface, and then suggest pitches on this surface. So it it, it all becomes um, they're all voiced within the same structure somehow. Mm-hmm. But it's a re- it's um, tricky, having a tough time. Do you write for it, or do you? Is it more improvised? Yeah, just improvised. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Do you plan on recording it? Yeah, I'm trying to get it together at the moment. I've recorded a couple of things here on my own, but nice. um, yeah, it's. Uh, 
I think I'm at the stage where I'm deciding if it's any good, which which for me is a it's complex hard. thing in itself. Yeah, <laughs> when you're on your own, like, is this any good? So what? A, what? A, how so do you know? That's a bad thought. Yeah, that's a bad thought, and that that usually ruins it for me. You know, right. especially if I'm in the moment. That's the right. that will get me every time. It's like this is yeah. you know. I talked to Marilyn Crispel and she was like the doubts that we have is some we voice we voice those doubts they're our doubts but we voice them with the voices of our friends and colleagues which is even meaner it's like no you're not alone with your doubts everybody is doubting you and it's the people that matter most to you are like Pablo this isn't yeah, you know this isn't happening man yeah stop yeah. trying man this is yeah. it, you know, yeah. and um, at best we we should ask ourselves this when we recorded it, you know, or you know if yeah. the process is process is over. But in the yeah. moment, <sighs> yeah, for sure, yeah, yeah, it's incredibly damaging. Yeah, but it's funny, particularly recording on your own, you you create something you created a product somehow, you know, mm. and it exists in its own right. And then, I mean, for me, I always try and listen with someone else's ears and actually imagine that you like taking the, the self out of the equation mm. and it doesn't, <laughs> it still doesn't really help somehow, you know? Yeah, it's true. <laughs> I still don't know if that does that work. And then of course, um, uh, also there's a, there's a for me there's always the balance there's always the question of the instrument you know and whether is this too much about the instrument you know mm. is this actually about music or is it about playing the trumpet really well yeah what you works know? on the trumpet yeah yeah wow. am i just just being the show-off guy that can just mm -hmm. do something on the horn that you know mm. or is it actually does it have um musical depth and meaning you know? yeah do you know this practice tape of clifford brown That's music. Shedding, That's enough music. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, in a way, you know, I I sometimes have to remind myself of that, you know, when, when I was doing my solo record or when I'm uh, preparing for a solo thing, I listen to all these solo pianists and to orchestras and then I think, oh, should I, I should be able to do all of this. Right. And then I listen to something like this, the Clifford Brown shedding. Yeah. And this is enough music. It's vo yeah, one voice, sure. and he's playing. He's playing, and I'm enjoying it. It's fine. Sure. That's yeah. fine. Or yeah. a, a violin partita by Bach. You know, yeah. that's yeah, yeah, enough yeah. music. And and not to downplay what it, you know, it's yeah. a magic music. But still, it's one voice, and I don't miss anything. Yeah, sure. I think it's also about the intention of the thing. Like when when you hear him shedding those licks, it's just. Um, you get a sense that they really belong to him and he's approaching it with really pure intention yeah. you know you don't get a sense that he's i don't know it's it it's not about him he's somehow serving the music you know but where is that fine line between serving the music in a really honest way and then forcing the music to serve you somehow yeah you know yeah yeah also on those tapes it's so nice that the door you know There's a knock at the door and yeah. then suddenly they're shaking. Or you hear pianists playing in the other room, you know. Right, right. You get a sense of the, the context where it was in. Absolutely, yeah. And, and just... people, the community working together towards something. Mm -hmm. That's nice. And like, maybe it's the times at the moment, but you, I think you inevitably feel very alone, I think, mm. when you're working on stuff now. Because yeah. you, can't, you can't practice with anyone. Mm. just kind of and when you, uh, when we get together here we're playing someone else's music you know mm. so may, maybe it's just a sign of the times i don't know there's going to be a lot of solo records coming out right um, <laughs> right everybody loves the solo records yeah <laughs> yeah did you do that a lot practice with other people together yeah sometimes yeah, yeah. with yeah. whom uh sometimes tr like trumpet players so and sometimes just getting together with um like doing routine Like mm -hmm. boring 
super boring things. It's really good for the um, for the chops to rest. I don't know if it's the same with the piano, but resting as much as you play because somehow there's only one capillary that feeds blood to the embouchure group. Mm-hmm. Or something. So resting as much as you play is a really healthy way of making sure the lactic acid is flushed away and then mm-hmm. the muscles can grow properly. Yeah. So that's it's useful to shed like that. So I've done some of that over the years with different people. Mm-hmm. And then just um, like sometimes it's nice to just work on some harmony things and actually just, okay, we're just going to take this thing and we're going to rotate it around this particular system. Because mm-hmm. you're somehow more focused then, aren't you? It's nice yes. to work as a team that way. Have you yeah. done the same thing? Not so much. I would do, like to do it more, actually, to practice with other people together and work on stuff together. Um, no, I, I would like to do that more. And I, I was always down to it, but uh, somehow it did, didn't really happen. Yeah. Uh, but also, I was never really a practice guy, you know. So it, maybe it wasn't in my system to ask somebody to, let's go practice, you know. Right. It's so funny you say that. I wasn't really a practice guy. I was a make music guy at home, you know, and, and uh, okay. spend time on music. But right. okay. it was never like um, technical or stuff. I think the technical abilities uh, grew with my need to you know express myself but through I, be, I didn't really work on technique really and i think it got dragged along with whatever else i was struggling with and and sure. trying to trying to come up with through necessity yeah yeah yeah, yeah. you know th- this is something i wanted to ask you about as well like coming back to hubert a little bit mm-hmm. and the idea and my my perspective has always been until a few weeks ago when Hubert was here mm. <laughs> in the van guesting. My perspective was always, okay, well you let the ear guide the body. Yeah. So the ear hears what you want to play, and then the body will fill the gap. Yeah, and everything will work just great. Mm. But Hubert was here, the, um, and I mean he's amazing this guy he's just a couple of conversations and suddenly like you your mind is yes. on fire with all these ideas and you're checking stuff out mm-hmm. and he was talking about um we got into this idea about you know virtuosi and wunderkind you know how mm. how do people get so good when they're so young when they haven't had even time to do their 10,000 hours or whatever right. how yeah. does this work so somehow it just works. And then we got into this idea of the, the bel canto thing. Did we talk about this? Shortly this... on the phone. And then I was like, let's do the interview now. Okay. Right. right. <laughs> so I'm glad we're getting into it. Right. right. Uh, this Italian singing tradition, the bel canto thing. And it's great. Of course, there's, there's so many connections with singing and playing trumpet, the mm. diaphragmatic breathing system and the, the openness here. And, um, and Hubert was saying, you know, you, Instead, you focus on the body and you trust that the ear will guide the sound. Mm. So it's, it's kind of the opposite way around that I've been thinking. And it, it's really... Um, but the thing is, the body, I mean, the, the, the listening, the ear is part of the body, isn't it? Yes. But it's it's also connected to other things. It's like the yes. portal to the soul and to the mind. Yeah. But I mean, what, what Hubert showed me and, uh, you know, lots of others was um, that the ear isn't something that you can flex. Right. And it becomes more uh, able to, to um, detect sounds and, and recognize sounds once you relax more and that right. relaxation is so much connected to a body. I mean, think you, I can't re, I can't, maybe it's something different for the trumpet because you're, it's not all relaxation, right? When you play, <laughs> no, but you have Ideally, to be relaxed to some extent. Yeah, yeah. But you have to be relaxed. And I felt like he was like, okay, this is like a, an, an antenna and it, but there's no, no real muscle that you can flex it. Uh, so you can hear better. So once you relax and that goes through your whole body, you can hear better. And that's why I think somehow this is connected, you know? 
Right, right. Re relaxation goes through the whole body and then um, then all of it is becoming easier, you know, the, the technical uh, side of it, but also the, you know, the, the more intellectual part of, of being able to hear. And that is usually when, you know, Hubert did this great ear training class and he would throw pitches at us and we would have to recognize them. Or he would start playing a standard and as I talked to you before, you know, would start playing a standard and by the third chorus we should be able to play along with him. Right, okay. And stuff like that, stuff where you at first think, shit, I'm never going to be able to, to do this. But uh, just being thrown into a situation like that, you rise to the occasion. But in those, those moments when you want to really, really want to recognize a pitch, you really go like, ah, ah. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. It's, it never works. As if it will help. So if you, yeah. and he was always like, don't stress it. Does it that, it's not about being fast about it. It's about being relaxed and right about this, you know. Right. Um, so... I became more and more relaxed and, and trusting more in that, in that it's going to come, you know, let it come, not don't force it. And that's such a, that was such a lesson on so many levels, like also in the improvisation parts, that's, that's basically what we're struggling with. You know, we're, we're not letting it happen. We're trying to make it happen. And yeah. sometimes we're lucky. And because I also see, a, um, a good side of that you know because there are people also who only let it happen and therefore don't get into certain areas because if you only let it happen sometimes uh, I, th I think you um, there's the possibility that you go to similar areas right interesting yeah 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 it's uh it's interesting Ten the tension in the body resulting in tension in the music i mean it's it's inevitable isn't it but the the I find a big difficulty for me comes with um, focusing on like my shortcomings and then working on my shortcomings. So for me, it, like time and trying to play really good time um, is so often the focus. So when I get the opportunity to play music, I'm focusing on that time. Right? I really need to really trying to make the time, which forces the music into a certain area, yeah. but also forces my body into a certain area mm -hmm. so the body is trying to force the ear to do something yeah and in, instead um it would be ideally it would be more successful to th think about what the body's doing and then the time will just glide in an organic right because way. you've heard good time for such a long time <laughs> you know right uh right. most of the recordings that you know probably have people with good time and yeah. uh, you know how it sounds, you know how it feels. Right. Now this is something else maybe you've experienced as well. And the, the ear training thing, I got one of those, uh, I was spending a lot of time on planes for a while and I got one of those apps and it was called, maybe it's called Intune or something. And it gives you a pitch as like um, uh, initial, what, what would you call it? Reference? The kind of, yeah, the reference pitch, and then it gives you a, a, the same pitch, but tuned in a certain direction. So the second pitch might be um, half a um, semitone flat. So you go flat. And the next one might be a quarter of a semitone sharp. So you go, oh, sharp. Oh, and it yeah. goes all the way down to, I don't know, like a t tiny percentage of the right. pitch. So I was doing this on planes and stuff, like just... To, Minus the oh, it's a bit flat, you know. Mm. And I found that hearing tuning changed in my ear, and then hearing records that I <sighs> excuse me, Gesundheit. Vielen Dank. And hearing records that I thought were really well in tune, like that Oscar Peterson thing. I remember Ray Brown's tuning being immaculate, yeah. and then going back and hearing it and going, oh, I did. I thought that was yeah. <laughs> I thought that was a, maybe and, he's not that good. Maybe he's not. <laughs> yeah. But then um, the same thing started happening with time, huh. like focusing on time so much and doing exercises like splitting up the beat into six different partials and particularly yeah. on bass and then playing um, crotchet lengths from this, you know, the second semiquaver, you know, all of this 
boring stuff that I was into at the time and hearing inside time more and then that becoming a bigger thing in my in my ear if you see mm. what I mean yeah so then I, I see more of my shortcomings <laughs> mm. and the whole thing becomes more complex and painful but also I mean you're hearing good time on records but also you're hearing uh flexible time and 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 time on usually on time on the recordings that we like is moving and is evolving and is not metronomic yeah. yeah yeah because also life isn't like that yeah so Absolutely. there's a there's different layers to that i think mm. but it's always i mean it, it's in relation isn't it time is relative as yeah. we learn mm -hmm. <laughs> So it's in relation to what else is going on around you. Yeah, that's that's the key. Whether this, you know, as a as a as a collective unit moves or not, is isn't really the thing. It's it's how the placement is related to to the environment. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what. Yeah, that's what really got me. Yeah. Can we talk about our mutual friend uh, Gipsy, Mike Gibbs? I and would love stuff that. Uh, that you maybe you just want to share a little bit of of things that you think you learned from him, and nice memories that you have of working with him and and studying with him and whatever comes yeah. to mind. Yeah, yeah, he's the most fantastic guy ever. I've got such fond memories of that time we spent in um, Almeria, Spain. Yeah, Spain. Yeah, yeah. But um, he first came to. Um, Uh, to Birmingham when I was maybe I was 20 or something and um, so two uh, he years was good ago, friends right? two years ago yeah yep. thank you yep. uh, and he was really good friends with Hans Collar who was um, a, a really dear friend of mine and also he was a, a one of my PhD supervisors so he's he's been a real guiding force for me and a really um, important friend over the years so uh, and when i was doing my un undergraduate um hans was teaching on the course he was teaching composition and he invited mike to come and do a workshop which was more like an interview which which was kind of a good thing knowing mike and mm. he gets he gets onto the stories and, you know. yeah and um we would have a one-to-one -one with him so I, i was trying to write a big band chart and he was kind of i'd take this 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 chart of the score and he'd be like well, why have you Why have you done this? It was that kind of lesson. It was really, it was fantastic. Yeah. And then um, uh, a few years later, we ended up doing some touring with him, playing with in his band. And, that was a tent yeah. head or something? Yeah, there was a tent head thing that we did. Uh, I can't remember the name of the record. And there was lots of Gil Evans music. Yeah. And some of his own uh, compositions. Yeah, lots of Gil Evans music. We did some touring and, Yeah, he's so nice, Gibbsy. We would always um, stay in this hotel in London, and on the way back, he'd be like, "Oh, I really want to, really want to have a salt beef bagel." So we'd have to go, <laughs> like, you know, one o'clock in the morning, find some somewhere to buy a bagel. But he's, I mean, you know, he's such a legend, and it's really nice that he has this deep connection here with the NDR. Mm -hmm. And even though um, I haven't been here while he's been a guest this it still feels like we have this kind of um you know yeah. mutual uh, relationship here mm. yeah i think this band has been very important for him as, yes. a, as a place to explore music and and he's been very important for this band and he, he i think he, he dearly loves the band and he was nice to recommend me also for this you know for this job yeah 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 fantastic And uh, what about you? I, I know he's. Whenever I speak to him, he always talks about you. Oh, Pablo. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, it's hard to explain, really, or, or because it's hard to to understand how a guy like this could be so interested in <laughs> what I'm right. doing. You know. Right. First time we were in contact was through, I think facebook messages or something and he was like yeah your record music and the, i have a dream i can't believe what you're doing there and i was like you can yeah you know yeah uh and he would always have questions for me and i was like yeah yeah but i have a question for you you know? yeah. <laughs> you yeah. have to tell me stuff what, yeah, what yeah, do yeah, i yeah. know yeah and um 
he's somebody, you know, to sit down with him and talk about a harmonic thing or something. You you could talk to him about stuff for hours, you know. And I think yeah. also in Spain we we did that. Yeah. He wanted me to explain investigations, my 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 record. Yeah. Uh, I mean the tune. Uh, to him because he didn't understand it and he was like show me how you do it and then we got into other stuff and he's like oh <laughs> <laughs> oh Pablo oh oh this is so <laughs> like <laughs> and um, this is something you know apart from all the great musicals uh, musical uh, things that I've learned from him this oh this thing is something that I have to remind myself of, you know, how can I be a guy like who has experienced so many things that we look up to and that we feel like we want to, we want to do stuff like that, you know, how can it be a guy like that be so enthusiastic and so uh, struck by one chord or at one note, you know, we would talk about the, that trio of Debussy, mm. uh, that sonata for a harp and flute and and what is it? Violin or viola? I'm, I'm not sure right now. And he would he would talk about one note and how this one note changes everything. And always when he hears this note, you know. Yeah. And I I, I have to remind myself to to leave um, or, the, or or let let feelings like this be a part of. I mean, really go for as I said before, go go find these feelings. Yeah. And not be yeah. like, yeah, but this is the nine of the chord. I know how a nine sounds like, you know, uh, you know, stuff like that. Do you really, uh, do you really, can you tap into the feeling when you first really recognized how the, the option nine sounds on a chord and how, right. what this does right. to you. And he right. seems to have a very, very exact and, and clear portal into that first feeling he still has that feeling yeah. and the more yeah. intellectual we get with all the stuff that we you know collect i think there's the the, the danger of losing it i mean yeah <laughs> danger of losing it uh, spiritually <laughs> psychologically as well but still um, i mean yeah. losing the the uh, excitement for it and right. he <laughs> he has it he has it for sure Absolutely. There's a, there's a beautiful childlike nature yes. to him, isn't there? And, uh, and I have a problem with this. I mean, I wish I had this thing. And he, he talks about these recordings and he'll listen to them like every day for a year or something, the same mm -hmm. thing, and still have the same experience. Yeah. Whereas I, I'm slightly different. I, uh, I become numbed too quick to things. So I have to save some things mm. that I really love it, to, in order to stretch out this experience so like if you listen to it to it too much it it lessens the effect it becomes over familiar yeah yeah it becomes normalized but and i, ta I talked to i talked to maria schneider about this and uh, because we talked about this effect that you um you transcribe something and then you go like ah, this is what it yeah. is it's just the ninth yeah. <laughs> right and then if you stay with it long enough, there comes the next phase, the next right, phase okay. of understanding and the next phase of um, appreciation for it. Yeah. First, it loses its magic because you realize what it is. But then that's, that poses other questions and that poses other difficulties. And, and But how could you come up with this? You know, now I know that, that I know what it is. Right. How right. did it arrive there? And that yeah. there's a new magic coming in. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I'm still too protective over things. Mm -hmm. Like the Caroline Shaw thing, you yeah. know, the Partita for Eight Voices. Yeah. Like I can't, I, I can't listen to it. I have to be very careful how much of it I listen to. It's too much. I have to stop it and go, okay. But that's Just... what you said, said to me the first time already. When yeah. you listened to it the first yeah. time, you had to stop. You said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I want to retain that, that thing. Also, some of your uh, records... I'm like I can't I can't listen to you too much. Mm. It's like it's it's, it's, it's too bad. Too much, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's too bad. Yeah. <laughs> too bad. Yeah. But yeah, but uh, Mike's got this wonderful there's somehow of course I mean because of his age and experience there's this depth of knowledge and understanding 
and then there's also a childlike nature to him but he he seems to feel everything and yeah. even to the extent of he'll he'll have us play something in a rehearsal and then he'll he'll stop us and then he'll kind of sit there oh <laughs> and then it'll be like you know people have got the newspapers out yeah <laughs> so, and he's just thinking about one chord or one voice in the, in the yeah. chord oh i think i'll oh and then on the other hand I remember a couple of moments. I mean, his conducting is legendary, you know. Mm. Often uh, he's <laughs> he's asking where beat one is, you know, because he's lost. He doesn't mm. know what's going on. But then on the other hand, there's been a couple of moments in concerts where he just conducting, he seems to draw all of the air and all of the lights and all of the energy in the concert hall with him. Yeah. So this incredible... Damn, it gives me tingles thinking about it. Yeah. And then suddenly the concentration in every member in the group is 100%. And it's just the most incredible musical moment. Yeah. It's got this, it's got this depth of power and also childlike, you know, nature, wonderful, playful nature. Yeah. Amazing human being. Yeah. Yeah. We should go and see him. We should take a trip when. Yes. Things we are should. okay. Malaga for the day. Have some fish on, this, yes. on the beach. Yeah. That would be great. I sometimes call yeah. him and then we get into things that we listen to at the moment and Yeah. And then he sends me stuff that I should listen to and I love this. I love this kind of relationship with uh with my fr yeah, with my friends like that, you know. Yeah. Yeah. That you let each other in into your process and what you're working on at the moment. That always gives me something to think about and always gives me uh, inspiration. This is why I do the interview series. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> because I want to have this relationship with uh, all the guys I admire, you know? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's a special thing. Also, that, that sense of community has been so important for the progression of the music over the, over the years, you know? Mm. And it's nice that this community can be global now for, for you. Being able to connect with people anywhere is fantastic. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. Congratulations, Pablo. Congratulations to you, man. I'm, I'm looking forward to your solo record. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. And the next time we'll see each other will be in summer, I think, to record the Buoyancy album if Corona... Permits. Uh, permits. Yeah. yeah. And the border permits. <laughs> yeah. Um, and there's firm dates for this. Yes. It's totally good to go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And since we had to postpone for a year, you know, um, there's uh, quite a lot of tunes that we could play with this band. Yeah. And uh, it was really nice to go back to those recordings now and step back into the excitement of this uh, combination of people. Yeah, it's unique. I wasn't really planning on having the sound. It was more about the people. Right. For me, you know. So, um, and I'm lucky that the combination sounds so nice, <laughs> in yeah. instrumental-wise, uh, you know. Yeah. But, um, yeah. but it was more about the people and the personalities and um, I'm excited about it. Yeah, me too. Love that band. That is something that I also wanted to know. How did you deal with with harmony, your understanding of it? Because we never seem to have any misunderstandings about the harmony or in, in certain tunes. Also, that goes back to what I said before. You always prepared um, in, in a deep way. So uh, how do you... What do you gravitate towards to when you see harmony on a page or hear harmony on on a recording? What do you gravitate towards? What are you looking for and how do you try to understand it? Uh, I'm, it's kind of, I'm really simple in this way, I think. It's, it's pretty basic. I, I start from how I understand the, the representation of the chord symbol into a chord scale relationship. Then, so that becomes the basic 
foundation. Mm. And I, I like this idea of once you know what something is, you can then understand what it isn't. And then, yeah. And then the options uh, are suddenly um, like, uh, lit up, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's not, it's not so complex. Yeah. That, that reminds me of a moment that I had also with Glow, with the bigger ensemble, but um, that was an early gig that ended up on the second Glow album. And it was a moment with Christian Weidner, the saxophone player. And he was, um, he was, uh, I think we were playing Pina Tubo. I don't know if we played this before together. It's no. one, of, one of my no. songs. And he was looking at a chord and he's, he's always great with uh, analyzing music. So he, he wrote down uh, all the notes that are in the chord and that make up a scale. And then right. below that, he wrote down, and Niels Klein pointed out, was what are these notes? And he's like, yeah, these are all the notes that aren't in the chord. It's good to know. <laughs> right. It's good to know. Yeah. And these yeah. can sometimes even be the notes that sound most interesting over this chord, absolutely. you know? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, essentially, if, uh, I, I say this is... We're just dealing with tension and resolution. Yeah, that's that's all it is in a, in every manner. Whether it's rhythmic tension and resolution, harmonic tension and resolution, dynamic, you know, financial. It's <laughs> it's it's always it's always the same thing, you know. Yeah. So no, knowing what isn't happening is the gateway to um, uh, guiding guiding the ear and the mind to you know to interesting linear construction. I think. Yeah, but also knowing what 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 it isn't gives you more a sense of what it is you know it, sure. it kind of cuts absolutely. it out it's a cut out thing you know yeah yeah absolutely yeah yeah exactly mm. yeah yeah once i once i um once i saw him do that i tried to do that more you know to right to see what it isn't and this is something that hubert does too you know he would find a scale and be like pablo check this check out this Eighth note, eleven note scale. So what's the pitch that isn't in there? You know, or, right, right. Uh, the, here's this ten note scale. Check it out. The only two <laughs> things that are missing are these. But you could play them as passing notes, and then right. it becomes like a bebop thing again. You know, and right. you hear the, right. you know, and stuff like that. He's always telling me about a new scale that he found. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and Probably all the possibilities. The, uh, yeah, it yeah it comes from the Rubik's cube uh, affinity that he has. Yeah. 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 That's yeah, that's one of the deepest things about him is just in, um, just just the amount of research and and going deep on one thing that that he has no matter what the content con content or the or the context is how deep he goes it's always something to aspire to for me you know yeah because yeah. i let i let go too soon usually like, ah, right. i think i think i got it but un until it comes like this if it doesn't come like this you you haven't got it you know you right right it's not not some subconscious enough yeah 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 but then i don't know i think there's something I don't know. I think when there's when there's room in something, the room, the space allows for um, light. You know, if something is too full, then the, there's no light in there. There's no space for variation, for movement, for, mm. for for new air. You know, I think I think that OCD ness, you know, the obsessive nature. I think we all have that to a certain extent. Yes, but but leaving something at a certain point allows still for the unknown. Which sure. can be, which can be filled by, you know, all of the other experiences and mm -hmm. and and things that you understand. I think that's also healthy, you know. Yes, it's true. It's true. Not suggesting that Hubert isn't healthy. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah. sometimes, I mean, have you often uh, experienced these moments where you have played something that you have maybe? Where you went like, oh, nev I never played this before. I never, how, where does this come from? And then discovering it and then analyzing this, you know. Have you yeah. done this? No, no. 
Not really. Hmm. I'm not a big listener of my own stuff, to be honest. I can't stand it so much. And also, it's that it's that thing. I'm sure I told you this one before. Um, Peter Evans told me this one, and maybe, maybe even Peter Bernstein. There's slide guy, slide trumpet player guy. Peter Bernstein, he's Peter, not the guitarist. Steve Bernstein. No, there's maybe it was Steve. Anyway, so yeah. um, Peter Peter Evans told me this thing, and he said, um, "You know, when you listen to yourself back, the stuff that you like, that's the stuff that reminds you of someone else. The stuff that you hate, that's you." Oh wow! And it's so true, isn't it? You know. <sighs> so actually, you know, you're looking that that thing of familiarity in you, and uh, and particularly in what we do, we aspire to the giants that the people that we spent so much time listening to, mm. and a actually the stuff that that shows your true self is kind of a little bit scary. Yeah. So for me, analysing where that's from and uh, and how I came to that, that's that's not something that's so attractive. Mm. Really. That's that's a deep quote. Wow. I have to think about that. Yeah. It reminds me a little yeah. bit of something that Robert said once in a workshop that we did. You know, it's you sit in a car for such a long time together and then you hear completely new stuff that you haven't heard them talk about, you know. And um, we had this workshop and um, then we somehow got into the topic of working on yourself, you know. And... Um, Robert said something like, um, yeah, we always want to get better at the top level of our playing, you know, but what we should really be working at is the, the, our getting our baddest, our worst uh, level up. Right. So right. when we listen to a recording of us and be like, this is the, the worst I've played yet, you know. This right. is actually how right. you sound. This is actually this is actually your level. Right. Okay. This is actually your ability, and everything else comes on top. So everything else that is is a bonus, like a great yeah. piano, yeah. great sounding room, great band, inspiration, a great yeah. song, whatever you know, uh, a great audience. You shouldn't work on you know the top layer. You should top, work on the, yeah, yeah, that, that really the, the baddest stuff. Like yeah, when your yeah, time yeah. isn't good and when your time, uh, where, where your sound isn't good and where your ha understanding of harmony doesn't really, you know, pan out or, you know, all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. That's, yep. that's your level. That's your level. That's, that's really interesting. It's hard. It's but how, hard. Does, how does one do that? How do you practice that? I think because so often. Yeah, go ahead. No, I just, I just thinking so often these things um, occur because of a, a number of elements fitting together. Maybe the, maybe the somehow the, the drums and the, the bass aren't really aligned so well in a, in a certain way. It doesn't give you that, that buoyant feeling, you know. Yeah. But how do you manufacture these things to work on it? Yeah, you have to be self-sufficient. That's the thing. You, you can't rely on having a great rhythm section. You want to be the guy or you should want to be the guy who is making that rhythm section so uh, so aware of what's not yeah. you know not, not what's not happening but what could happen that they rise to the occasion you want to be the yeah. strong guy you don't want to be the guy who's reliant on everybody else to be so great that you can uh, um, show your greatest self you want to be the guy yeah. who's strong for others and who can be you know the grounding factor for others to rise above that's a that's a social thing that's a you know that's that's really I've a social you do thing this. i've i've heard you do this because you have that strength but how do you, i mean i i don't have that strength i don't have that i don't um, think so ability i don't think so i think well, you have it i, I think uh, i think i'm more sensitive more susceptible to environments that are 
more difficult to play in. And and for me, things take over. Like I play too much, so the space things disappeared. The time thing is forced, so it doesn't swing. Mm. You know, all of these kind of mechanisms, the fail safes come in. And I can relate to that. Are... I can so re and I know I know this. But still, it's a perspe perspective thing. You know, I listen to you yeah. in different uh, environments, and we've had different experiences together. You know, not all with. Yeah our favorite band or whatever you know we've played yeah. in different things yeah. so yeah. i've heard you do the same thing but for you in the moment it doesn't feel like it you know sure. you're, you're yeah, very yeah. concerned with okay i need to get this thing you know uh, and you're trying and of course this yeah. doesn't sound like to you it doesn't sound like your preferred way of playing but you're actually helping you're actually helping through the way you do it But I think working on it is addressing those things, like how can I be self-sufficient? How can I be strong for others? How can I show yeah. somebody what the chords are if they don't, if they are lost? Right. How do I right. actually, how do I actually sense that somebody's lost? That's on a social level, but also is my hearing that good that I know when Percy is lost and I have to show him where the where the chords are? You know. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Or um, how can I, how, what do I have to do? Because we as pianists, we have to play on sh sh sometimes shitty instruments and different instruments each night. How can I find the sweet spot and still play how I like? Or find enjoyment in playing differently each night, but still having the affirmation that um, I will still sound like me even on a shitty piano, you know? Right. right. Stuff like that. I, th I think that's yeah. addressing the, the, the lower levels of, the, of your talent, <laughs> you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's interesting how we, I, I think about this a lot, how we quantify this success, what it is to be successful in something, like what mm. it is to have a successful gig or what mm. it is to have a successful solo or a successful interaction on a, a musical level. Now, how you gauge that um, as an individual to how I might gauge that for you. Oh, yeah. that was that was a good thing because of, you know. Yeah, right. It's so different for us. It's so different. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes yeah, yeah, in yeah. recordings, you record something and you go, okay, can we do another take? I played this little thing. Right. And that little thing can ruin your whole perspective, uh, perce perception of that nine minute track that you did, sure. it's going to ruin everything because yep. of that one thing. And uh, others there have to be there for you to, to say, yeah, have you but you corrected yeah, but it afterwards through what right. you played. Right. Otherwise, sure. all the stuff that you play after that doesn't make any sense because it's in relation to what just happened. Absolutely, yeah. We kind of the worst possible um, people as individuals to gauge it would have been you know. funny if the if the sentence would just stop there <laughs> kind of the worst people <laughs> thanks for the podcast thanks, see man. you next <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean we as artists are so in our heads the whole time you know and we have to get out of it and and um focus more on the social aspect of it of, of playing together and finding something together yeah for sure but that's difficult isn't it because you're with different people all the time i mean mm. it's different for you with a trio of course mm. having a, a long-standing ensemble like that that you know really well but so often you're working with different people all the time and it's kind of it's kind of hard to get that consistency and, and trust i think yes of course you can compare it But there's a, also a skill with people, and I think you have that skill of, of connecting with people quickly, finding a common ground. And then yeah. um, that's a social skill as well, you know, on, to on top of the musical. I mean, you can't really yeah. take them apart. You know, they, they sure. go together. Yeah. But there yeah. are people who, who need their comfort zone of, okay, I've played with those guys for such a long time and... I need this kind of thing, you know, or like, okay, let's find, let's find, find a thing, you know? Yeah. Yep. Let's find our thing. What is it? Sure. 
and that's something that you of course you want it to be good but also you have to surrender to how the soup tastes if you put together these four ingredients and that's yeah, how it sure. is and let's find the best way to make it yeah enjoyable yeah. you know or yeah 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 sure chris potter talked about it yeah a lot when when i talked to him about music or certain recur recordings or bands that he was in he was sometimes not very emotional about them of course he would sometimes be like ah oh, it was the greatest thing but also he said yeah it worked right it worked and at first i was like yeah yeah it worked i mean so maybe it's also a language barrier there for me to understand how he meant it but still there's something to be said about making something work what does it mean you know writing a song that works it's not always about writing the greatest piece on earth sure yeah Who, who's able to do that anyways but uh, finding st something that works that you can put in front of somebody and it works and it stand it's, stands on its own yeah yeah so that word was something that i thought more about you know how can i make it work with other people yeah sure yeah yeah and he's very yeah. consistent he's very consistent and he can make yeah. a sound a band sound great i've heard him drag along a whole big band <laughs> with his time unbelievable yeah. yeah straight out of the case like no warm-up yeah 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 force of nature yeah yeah um Let me uh, let's close with um, I'm reading I'm reading this I'm, I'm really into Coltrane these days read this great biography by Lewis Porter and now yep. I'm going back to this great book of interviews only with Coltrane it's called Coltrane on Coltrane really really great I don't know if you know this one. I don't know that it's it's made up out of uh, interviews or articles with quotes by him and they put in the book chronologically so it's um right until the end of his life and so you can see the the progression and he always talks about what he would like to sound like and he's very he's very he's very honest about it you know he's also very honest about it, what he thinks his shortcomings are or even the shortcomings of his band you know he has a very very um honest way and down-to-earth way to speak about the music and what he would like to sound like and i get more curious about we we don't talk about this in interviews so much what we would like to sound like you know what we're struggling with he's like yeah i'm playing too much and uh trying to not play as uh, harmonically involved as as much i'm trying to get more into melody and on it is the greatest guy about this and i want to you know he's my role model now and i want to have my band probably i'm not going to have the pianist come for me anymore in the next year or so and stuff like that he's very specific about certain things that he thinks he needs to work on and mm -hmm. and um so i'm curious what you want to sound like i knew you would about to say that pablo um yeah it's tricky isn't it because when we when we feel when we think about what we want to sound like immediately um names come into the mind i want to sound like this person or this or this person and of course that that's an easy way of thinking about it but the the, the quick answer is i i want to sound more like myself yeah and improve sounding like myself of course but how to do that is um the complex thing i mean actually many of the same things you just mentioned it, space we always talk about space and i don't leave enough space and uh there's too much ego sometimes i think it becomes about self-protection rather than music yeah like getting through something you know when i when i feel uncomfortable i i do something that i know i can do in order to be you know to be um to survive <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah that mm. moment yeah particularly when you're recording lots of stuff you do something that you know will just sound good even yeah. though it's it's not really in alignment with your artistic agenda at, at that moment so for sure space 
for me, time is always a big issue. I don't know whether it's because I'm just too focused on it, hmm. but I just I want to play with great time and the, and a great feeling of time, like projecting energy through motion. You know. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, another one, another big one, and I'm always talking about this with my students is uh, melody, improvising mm. melody. The m m most favourite moments on recordings are always when it's it's hinged around melody. You can, I can hear some in my head already from people, like particularly people like Jarrett. Yeah, you know those moments where he's amazing, Lovano. You know. Mm some beautiful moments of Chet Baker. It just sounds like they've improvised a melody that's more interesting and more beautiful than the melody itself somehow. Yeah. That's, that's really remarkable. But how to contextualize these things inside the many other things that you're working on, it becomes a, a, a melting pot of disparate, you know, elements sometimes. How can I talk about melody when I'm also talking about studying 12 time rows or how, how can I possibly be thinking about sounding great on standards when I'm just practicing extended techniques, you know? Mm -hmm. So another big thing for me is finding a way of connecting all these yeah. elements, which I, I have no idea how that works, mm. but maybe in the future, maybe, it, maybe it does it. Uh, this is something that is done on its own just by you putting in the work on those different fields and then allowing uh, the subconscious to do the work for you in the creative work, you know? Yeah. 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 When allowing the ear to guide you in an honest way. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. Yeah. But that's... Uh, For me, that's a, a long distance away. Yeah. It will always be a long distance away, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's both uh, nice and 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 crazy at the same time, you know. Yeah. Where it talks about the mountain, you know. You climb that mountain and you sometimes have to uh, climb through clouds And maybe your teacher is a little bit far ahead, but that mountain is infinite, you know? Yeah. You go, you go through the clouds and then, oh, shit, it's, it's even yeah, bigger than I thought, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, we're all yeah. climbing the same mountain, but from different, you know, we have different techniques and different approaches. But, you yeah. know, we'll we, we keep on climbing. Yeah, for sure. Um, what about you? Same, same thing. Same thing. Same thing as you. I mean, same thing as Coltrane in a way. You know, I'm. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to be more melodic. I want to be sound less like a pianist. How, however, I, I want to have more ability and more control over this instrument that I can more easily access my ideas and be more self-sufficient when I'm playing alone. Yeah. Also. Get yeah. get a hold of my ego and uh, the same things. I mean, we're very yeah. very similar in in those yeah. regards. And um, but I, I'm I'm trusting. I'm trusting that everything will. Um, I mean, the the whole body and the the creative mind is such a filter and such a funnel. Funnel is yep. the right word. Um, mm -hmm. It'll take care because I mean I see so many things come coming outside of my of my hands of my my, my body um, stuff that I have been working on consciously but also stuff that I haven't you know it's it's coming out and so I trust that everything that I would put put in will find its way out so somehow it's so just natural yeah 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 and. Um, so I can have yeah. more fun with the putting in part and then just trust yeah. the putting out part a little bit more because when I, ge when I eat the good stuff, I'll, I'll feel better. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. 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 
But I, I love it, that it, we can be so so honest with each other about these uh, things, despite even this being an interview and, and a public conversation. And I thank you for for doing this with me. And I, I, oh, I apologize. It's a pleasure for me. It has been a long time because we talked about I think the first time I asked you to do an interview was that tr car ride from the airport in Malaga to to Almeria, I think. That's the first time I asked you, and then we kind of put it off somehow. But I'm glad we did this. Yeah, you know. me too. I mean, I'm. Um, I don't know why you would want to chat to me, but I'm very glad, very glad to do it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's always really nice, nice to catch up with you. Okay. Thank you so much, and um, let's keep in touch, and hope to yeah. see you very, very soon. Yeah.